Well, thanks everyone for joining us today for another one of HydroTerra's webinar series. We have got a huge number of registrants for this particular topic. And today's topic is landfill caps, the pros and cons of conventional and green alternatives. Joining us today, we have Dr. Brent Davey, who's come back for more. So many thanks, Brent, for joining us today. Uh, for those of you who don't remember Brent from a previous webinar on landfills, uh, Brent is a principal environmental scientist with Fife, and he has a long history of working in environmental consulting and What's particularly relevant to today's presentation was he was a leading research scientist on alternative caps for landfills in a program that was called the ACAP program. And some of the slides today that Brent's going to be going through relate back to that research. Um, but a little bit of housekeeping before we get into things. I think we've covered that one. So we love your questions, as you know, and we would like to see them typed into the Q&A section, which you'll find on your screen. So if you type into those, I will read those questions out at the end of our presentation and endeavor for Brent and myself to answer those um, at the end. So please have them coming through. We've got some good early bird questions. We've got about six there. So thanks for sending those through too. So we'll leave a bit of time at the end. Why does HydroTerra do these webinars? Well, we are passionate about sharing knowledge about everything technology and how it can be applied. We believe in the importance of facilitating education, particularly at a time when uh, most people just most organisations just don't seem to be able to find the time to train the industry. So we're trying to do our bit to help there. And we like to take an industry leadership position around uh, improving the way things are done. So that's really why we're sharing this knowledge. And I guess we love to collaborate with people. So having Brent here is an example of that too. So what are we talking about today? So Brent's going to do a general overview of landfills, what happens when a landfill is closed and the post-closure covering and ongoing management. He's then gonna talk, and this is really the core of it, he's going to talk about conventional and alternative capping strategies that can be used. Then I take over and I talk about uh, these transpiration caps in a bit more detail and uh, with more of a focus of how we actually monitor their performance. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Brent and thanks very much, Brent. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and uh, I'm uh, delighted to be back again. Um, with uh, HydroTerra on this. Um, it's an area I've been interested uh, in for a long time. And um, uh, I was actually fortunate to uh, be the first research manager for the ACAP program uh, here in Australia in 2006. It's been about 15 months sort of getting it started and building the first two um, test systems, one of which I'll talk about a little bit today. Um, but uh, I've since uh, spent more than my fair share of time on landfills, um, so I know a little bit about it. Um, this job of capping landfills when it's, you know, the, the landfill is more or less finished, it's actually quite an important part of the whole exercise. So next slide, please. So what do we mean by landfill? Um, well. They've tended to be um, depressions in the ground, usually. Uh, very often gullies and that sort of stuff. And that's how they start. People chuck rubbish in them and, and um, you know, small towns and that sort of thing start building them up. And, but ultimately, 
Um, it's interesting that these days in cities, so uh, very often the major um, waste management companies were actually before that um, quarry companies. So they're the ones with the big holes. And, and so here in Melbourne, for example, most of our landfills used to be um, quarries, um, sand in particular, or, or um, uh, say the Hanson Quarry up north um, was, uh, and, and still is, um, uh, removing basalt. Um, I think the, the one at Werribee is also was a, a basalt quarry. So you've got these big holes and, and they're great things to fill. So the fill is virtually any waste that we are trying to dispose of. And the whole idea is that um, a landfill is at least somewhere specific where we know that we can um, deal with it. The important thing is that the fill never stays the same unless you're talking about very clean construction waste, which of course is completely inert. But otherwise, if you've got food wastes and that sort of stuff in it, um, they de de decompose and degrade and release various gases that we also want to manage. Um, but for the purpose of this uh, talk also, it's important to understand the concept of airspace, which is the space above the landfill. Next one, please, Richard. Okay, and so um, you wind up with this mass of waste. Um, and um, there are a number of potential outputs from that waste. Um, perhaps the first one is simply litter, stuff that gets blown off the top, um, washed away by rain. Um, it's one of the first signs that you've got a, a landfill nearby is very often um, the wind blown litter. But odor is another one. The uh, inevitably the um, um, the, the food, etc. Rotting is uh, um, an important part of the deal, and uh, the odour is often you know, quite offensive. Um, it, partly because methane itself has got an odour that a lot of people don't like. Um, but the other thing that the environmental regulators are particularly concerned about is leachate, which is the liquid that accumulates at the bottom of this massive waste. Um, so, and it, it potentially causes problems with. Um, groundwater. Anyone who's ever been near a landfill will also realise that um, things like seagulls, um, ibises, they, uh, you won't see them so often during the daytime, but rats, that sort of stuff, they're also a problem. And so um, in the next slide, um, oh, you know, I should say that in that mass of waste, particularly where you've got biological material, um, and uh, the MSW in the heading it speaks of municipal solid waste, which um, uh, has all the food scraps, et cetera, that we households chuck out. Um, and this is the process that goes on over time, um, where you can see different gases uh, evolved by the system. Um, and it is a system. Um, it's important even to take into account the settlement that happens. I'll talk about it a bit later on. That's the amount of um, the way that the waste actually um, compacts over time. Um, gas is evolved by the, the mass of waste and again over time. What this rather ratty diagram, which comes from the UK, um, and that was the best they could produce, um, it, what this diagram doesn't tell you is how long we are looking at. Typically, a putrescible landfill can keep evolving methane for as long as maybe 15 or 20 years. Much beyond that, there's very little methane left um, and other things happen. But you need to be aware that a landfill does keep evolving methane in particular for a very long time. So I'll have the next one now, please. Okay, so um, what happens when you fill a landfill? Um, and it's just sort of by way of definition, a landfill is filled when it runs out of airspace. Um, think about it. Most landfills started before um, the surrounding area develops. Um, and there have been all sorts of pressures on the lateral expanse of these landfills. They can't keep expanding horizontally 
um, forever. Um, and all too often we have incidents, and, and there's been several in Victoria, where um, residential areas have encroached closer and closer to landfills and then suffered because there's been landfill gas and various other things. Um, so very often the only way that a landfill can expand is by um, increasing its height. So expanding into the, the airspace. But you do reach a point where you just can't go any higher um, for a variety of reasons. Um, and then you have to look at what happens next. If I could have the next slide, please. And, you know, the good landfills, the, the ones that are operating to collect municipal waste do try to be good neighbours. Um, and so they're trying to minimise their, their outputs. Um, they try to collect leachate, for example, but of course you can't do that if you haven't planned to. Um, a leachate system, a leachate collecting system is not something that you can put um, in after your landfill has been in place. Um, any of you old enough to remember Alice's restaurant, the Lalo Guthrie, you know, he put his letter with his address on it under the landfill, under the waste you're on. Um, no, it doesn't work like that. You've got to um, plan to put a liner in and to collect the leacher. Um, but let's assume that's what your landfill has done. That's how it works. Um, but also, you put a cover on it, and the cover, as I've drawn here, is at least two uh, components to it. Um, and um, you also need to put some sort of system to relieve the pressure of the gas that is being developed. Very often, this is a reticulated pipework system that captures the gas and can use it. Um, so um, the a lot of landfills actually use, uh, generate electricity from the gas they collect and so on. Um, and then you can see in the background of this, that's a standard, how a standard cover on a well-managed landfill looks like. It's you know, kept mown, um, but it's uh, well grassed and so on. Um, but um, I guess it's fair to say that a landfill really is only as good as its cap. Next slide, please, Rich. Um, so the caps, got a number of aims. Um, and it's important to think about all of these things are long-term operations. Um, you can't just sort of chuck the waste in, then cover it and, and walk away. Um, this goes on for a very long time. And the idea is that the waste has to be covered, covered for the long term. You've got to prevent nuisance litter. You've got to prevent access to um, birds and animals, um, and you've got to particularly prevent pollution to nearby waterways, um, you know, the blowing of litter and all that sort of stuff. You also need to stop rainwater infiltrating into the, the, into the, the mass of waste. And the reason for this is, as that graph um, showed earlier, that inevitably um, putrescible waste rots. Um, it, it breaks down um, and releases uh, not only gas, but generates this leachate, which is typically quite acidic, um, very smelly, and um, be, by virtue of being acidic, it will tra transfer lots of uh, metal ions and things and other um, toxic substances uh, potentially into groundwater. Um, but we also need to manage the landfill gas um, and the purpose of CAPS is um, to do that, to minimise the amount of fugitive emissions. Um, and then, of course, as you'll see in some of my slides later, uh, the visual amenity of um, these landfills is really not very high. And so the purpose of covering them is to make them look a bit better. And on the next slide, please, Richard. Um, it's just generally speaking, uh, and in the most um, schematic, if you like, um, way, this is the kind of cover that people put on the waste. Um, if they can afford it, it includes an impermeable geomembrane. That's this is very expensive material, but it is also very effective because it's completely impermeable. Um, 
but being largely plastic, um, it's you, not something you leave uh, by itself, so it has to have some sort of vinyl cover on which you can put grass or some other vegetation to make it look good. Um, underneath, you need um, various protective layers to, to protect that geo membrane from the waste. Remember that the waste uh, degrades and compacts and anything sharp that's inside the waste tends inevitably to um, wind up breaching that impermeable geo membrane they've got on top. And that's one of the main reasons why these things fail, um, that the waste inside actually um, breaches the, the geo membrane. And can I have the next slide, Richard? Um, so capping's actually, you know, even the conventional capping is fraught with difficulty. And I think it's fair to say the industry would agree that conventional caps certainly struggle to, to meet all their expectations and requirements. Um, for starters, it's not something that anybody can do, just slap some sort of clay over the top of a, a landfill and um, you know, hope that it provides an effective cover. They require a great deal of specialist design expertise and crews that are used to working in this sort of environment and um, handling the clay um, in such a way that it, you know, the, the, um, the chances of cracking are minimised and the clay is properly applied across the whole of the area and particularly at the edges. Um, these are some examples of edge defects, you might say, in capping, um, where you can see the, the waste is sticking out the sides, basically, of, of various landfills. The one at the bottom is a small um, quarry landfill um, up in Northern Victoria, um, where the, the land has slumped, or rather the, the landfill itself has slumped, and the, so the cover has been pulled down, and as a result, um, you can see the sort of, in the foreground by the tree there, they're sort of cracking right along the edge of the, uh, the perimeter of the, um, of the, the, the landfill area. And so it's also fair to say that conventional caps don't adapt very well to the shrinking and subsiding of landfill contents. Next slide, please, Richard. Um, and even if they try, as you can see, they're, um, they're certainly not um, sort of attractive places. Um, and these are just two examples from Melbourne. Um, this is actually almost happening while we speak. Um, the image on the right is not so much a landfill, but a facility that was trying to handle recycled materials um, and send them off to China. And of course, got stumped by the Chinese ban on mixed recyclables and that sort of stuff. The material you see here is the material that even they felt they couldn't recycle. Um, and it's pretty horrible. So this is why people hope to cap stuff. Anyway, given the difficulties with conventional caps, do we have an alternative? And so rather than trying to, to make, if you like, a dry tomb, um, a container that is completely impermeable to water and gas, um, in the mid nineties, the Americans, Bless their cotton socks, decided that they might try something else. And this idea was probably promoted initially by um, plant um, scientists who understood that plants actually take an enormous amount of water out of the ground with their root systems in a process called transpiration. So there is a net movement. Um, any plant will tend to withdraw water from the soil and transpire it through the leaves. Um, and if you get this right, then presumably this is a process that you can harness to um, 
remove the water. So the idea of transpiration caps or ET caps, evaporation transpir evapotranspiration caps, phyto caps, uh, all sorts of different names for them, um, is that instead of using compacted clay um, and impervious materials as the, the, the cover material or matrix, you use something spongy, um, uncompacted soil um, or any other material that will, will promote the growth of plants uh, or allow the growth of plants and has enough capacity to hold the sort of water that you'd expect to come from rainfall, et cetera, at your particular location. And the plants can then remove the water um, by this process called transpiration using their root zones. But it's better than that because inevitably that root zone area develops um, a population of microorganisms that, if there's methane present, can break it down and um, thereby prevent the escape of, of methane to, uh, to the environment, which is one of the other purposes of a landfill cap. Um, and so, with time at least, these populations develop and the amount of methane that can be um, effectively destroyed or metabolized is quite substantial and they can be quite effective at, at preventing methane from escaping. Further, because you don't need to compact them nearly as much and because there's potentially a wide variety of media you can use, um, they should be easier to make. Um, and so um, that was the, the basis, I guess, for um, the design. Um, can we have the next slide, please, Richard? So they were a great idea. Um, and even before people started working on them extensively, um, the, it was realised that there were um, a number of issues that you had to be a bit careful about in, in choosing and building a, an ET cap. The first thing, I guess, is simply the slope of the surface. Um, the idea is that you try and run off as much rainfall as possible. Rather than have it percolate into the landfill contents, you try and have the surface run off, run away, and you manage that properly. Um, obviously, the um, how much water holding capacity of your cap um, will depend on your climate. And so that in turn will determine the thickness of material you require. And then you've got um, a whole range of plant issues that um, sort of are to do with the extraction and transpiration of, of the water. You need plants that can transpire a lot. Um, you need plants that can establish themselves rapidly. Um, and if they won't, how do you manage the risk of erosion until they get big enough to keep the surface stuff from moving around? Um, so, you know, what are the best species? Are they necessarily native or imported or whatever? Um, and indeed, do we simply plant a set of plants and walk away, or do we think about um, different um, a sequence of plants over time. Um, and, you know, for starters, it's probably true that you wouldn't want to be running um, ET caps, or you'd have to spend a bit of time thinking about them and getting them to work in places that are very humid with um, lots of, of um, moisture in the air, etc., so that there's not so much um, requirement for plants to transpire water from the root zone. Um, how does the plant cover evolve over time? And, you know, particularly, will the me medium you're planning to use for your cover actually support the plants? Um, these are really quite uh, critical issues. And of course, methane actually is not so much toxic, but it, it smothers root zones. Um, the, by, by excluding oxygen, it can cause plants to struggle because uh, they can't get oxygen to their roots. Next slide, please, Richard. 
Anyway, um, in 2006, uh, the AACAP program started and it was inspired in many ways by um, a trial that was run by the Willert Landfill that started in about 2004, I think, um, where a couple of trial plots um, of these alternative covers um, were um, established. And the guys at, at Willert actually, all, all they were using for cover material was what's called quarry scalpings, which is just the, the dirt scraped off the rock before they then get the, the basalt out. Um, and um, uh, they set up these two trial plots, which um, as you can see, the vegetation is quite established and looks quite attractive um, over time. Um, the landfill I talked about in the north um, has a section where they did put one of these transpiration covers on years ago, and they use wallaby grass as the material to, um, uh, you know, and, and that is actually quite effective at transpiring um, up there. Um, next one, please, Richard. Okay, this is the first uh, of the test cells that the ACAP program um, established. Um, down at the Cedar Landfill at Glindhurst, um, the, um, uh, it was a range of uh, controls and, and test cells um, comparing side by side um, phytocaps and conventional covers. Um, and in this particular case, the, the cells were actually dug into the waste, uh, sorry, dug into the cover that was already in place um, to, um, so that the control for the conventional cap was simply all the surrounding um, area. Uh, but you can see there is a succession of plants over time um, and you know, 15 years later, there's quite an established uh, plant um, community on the surface of these things, but um, it does come and go a bit as the 2017 photo shows. It's a bit stressed at times. Um, and so there are some issues that we can talk about. Unfortunately, as far as I can establish, the um, facilities that ACAP put in place um, are not currently being monitored and worked on, um, but that may not be the, the case. I'm just trying to establish what's going on because as this indicates, there's a, a lot of long-term work that um, is being done. Um, next slide, please, Richard. So nevertheless, what the ACAP program has been able to show um, is that BT caps do work. Um, they reduce drainage um, just as well as conventional caps do, and in many ways their behaviour is more predictable. They are at least as good as ordinary caps at oxidising methane and, and reducing fugitive methane emissions. More important, perhaps, is that they're sustainable. They look after themselves much more than... Um, conventional caps and they're self-healing. So they resist the cracking that happens in a conventional cap um, because they tend to conform much better with the surface of the waste map, mass. Um, and, and you can choose the plant species according to um, the local area and climate. And that's another import, important advantage. You don't have to scour around to find clay of a specific characteristic in your environment you can use um, you know just local plant species but you do need to test that um, you don't need to use clay or geomembrane you don't even need soil um, the land for, uh, the, the um, auto covers at uh, Lindos for example used a mixture of sand and compost um, and I'll come back to what you can and can't do with the media 
shortly. Um, and really the only maintenance is looking after the plants themselves. And if you have some sort of fissure or the plant dye water, it's relatively easy to fix. If on the other hand, you've got a conventional cover and you start getting cracks in the clay, they are not actually amenable to just being you know, patched up or whatever, it doesn't work that way. And they, once cracked, a landfill cover doesn't really uncrack um, in the conventional um, clay format. Um, that's one of their problems that um, they don't repair themselves very well. The important thing perhaps about ET caps to consider is that it's entirely possible to adjust them and design them so that they will allow some water to get into the waste. And that can actually support faster decomposition. Now, I mentioned that landfills are long-term exercises, but nevertheless, they probably don't operate fully for more than sort of 20, 25 years. Um, so in a sense, anything that gets the waste decomposed to a stabilized state is very useful. And you know, before the landfill closes. So there is an option to, in a sense, turn the whole practice of landfill management around so that the legacy impacts are nowhere near as great. Next slide, please, Richard. So um, if there are some issues with conventional covers and alternative covers are so fantastic, why, aren't, why isn't everybody using them? And this is a critical and important question. They're not simply, ET covers are not simply sort of set and forget type systems. They do need care and attention. And I think it's that, partially that lack of understanding and, and sort of whispering around the industry that says, nah, don't go that way. don't go there, they don't work. That's not true, but they do need care and attention and understanding of, of where the issues are. Um, and you, you can't have an evapotranspiration cap that hasn't got plants on it that evapotranspirate. <laughs> so, You've got to worry about the plants. You've got to understand the, the ways in which they transpire, um, the species, that your climate and seasons, that sort of stuff. And in particular, the characteristics of the soil, the amount of water it will hold, how hard it holds that water. That's this function called soil suction. Um, and soil suction, as Richard will explain a bit later on, but basically what that means is that the higher the soil suction, the harder the plant has to work to actually extract water from the ground with its roots. Um, its structure and things like total organic carbon, they're all critical issues in um, getting the right soil. So you need to take care about the medium and you can't just chuck any old dirt on, on the top of your um, uh, waste um, so that uh, you just can't set it and forget it. And it's for these sorts of reasons that the regulators still aren't very comfortable with ET caps. Um, I think it's fair to say that they're becoming more so, uh, partly because there are now well-established guidelines for using, uh, you know, designing and using ET caps. Um, and they've actually been approved for landfill covers um, across Australia, um, I think, that may not be quite the case in West Australia, or it will happen. Um, and the reason in West Australia is that the, uh, the capping with sand is a bit of an issue. Um, but I think that's being sorted out. Anyway, um, one of the, the, the ways in which the EPAs of this world can be satisfied is by the data you can produce in experimental systems like the ACAP. Um, project we're trying to do. And as you can see, there's a number of variables that we are looking at to, or that we need to look at to um, be able to assess how effectively a cover is working. Any cover, doesn't matter what kind of design, 
but the fundamental principles are that you're looking or trying to quantitate transpiration, evaporation, and the two of them go together um, so that they have a net effect on how much water is removed. Um, you need, of course, to know the precipitation and runoff. Um, so how much rainfall, how much just drains down the slope, all that sort of stuff. But there is also what's called lateral flow within the cover. Um, that needs to be measured. And then how much percolates into the waste and how much leachate you produce. So these are all um, variables that if you're going to be promoting a new design or whatever, or any design to the EPAs, you need to have addressed these issues when you're um, sort of setting out the design. Next, please, Richard. So here's one way is to use um, what are called lysimeters. Um, and lysimeters are um, basically big tubs that are designed and constructed in some, such a way that there is a big area of your cap within them. So that edge effects and that sort of stuff are minimized and you can actually work on the cover material at scale. This diagram just summarizes the various components of, of where you have a conventional cover compared with a, a phyto cover. Um, and um, the idea being that you can then instrument them as Richard will talk about, you need to know things like temperature, soil moisture, soil suction, conductivity, a whole lot of other parameters um, that all need to be looked at. And to also understand that these things are not totally idiot proof. Um, and there are problems with things like um, the meters that you use to measure water flow, um, if you don't understand that they need to be maintained and that sort of thing. Next slide, please, Richard. So this is just an example of um, the construction of the lysimeter pans at, uh, that happened at Lindhurst, for example. Uh, they're certainly not your average bench top um, devices. The minimum dimensions of the lysimeter that uh, you can see in the middle um, or the pan, um, the middle image at the bottom there, um, that is 20 meters by 10. So that's quite a substantial size and quite an amount of work to build. Um, and um, some of the other photos there just so, show some of the building that's going on. Um, the two images on the right are just showing, in this case, the insertion of um, soil moisture meters, or soil mo moisture sensors. Um, and you've got to remember that what you are doing is trying to instrument a potentially unstable medium for the long term, 10, 20 years. So a lot of work has to go into how you connect it up to the various leads that go to other things, how you protect those. Um, and so um, the sort of longevity of how you place these sensors, et cetera, is quite important. With that, I think I'm done, Richard. Um, knowing that you have got some more to, to say about particularly this stage of things. So I'll hang around and, and let you take over. Thank you. Thanks, Brent. That was excellent. So I'm going to talk about monitoring of these structures that uh, Brent has been um, suggesting as a better way to go for capping in various situations. Just looking a little bit at the current regulations that people in uh, Victoria would be familiar with, the best practice environmental measures um, for landfills. We have a couple of key numbers which apply to all caps and transpiration caps don't get any special treatment as such in terms of their overarching performance. So what is the performance, the magic number? 75% of the seepage rate 
through the basal liner at the bottom of the landfill, okay, which is 10 litres per hectare today, per day, is, is the target. So you can't have more coming in than it's going out is really the emphasis there. So that's ultimately what we're trying to measure is how much water would be coming through these caps and we're measuring it against that compliance criteria. If you want to see more information about such things, just you can have a look online at the, the BEPM. It's a Victorian EPA publication. So that's a compliance number, but to actually measure is this cap working as designed, there's a lot more things to that. And that's really, these measurements are, in my opinion, more important uh, than your compliance number, particularly during the early phase. Most of these sites, they sort of allow for about five years to establish vegetation and that sort of thing. So you're wanting to know, is the cap sort of starting to work as it's designed, um, as the plants establish themselves, what changes are we seeing? Uh, and they're very interesting caps because they're quite dynamic, you know, and... Um, uh, from a monitoring perspective, they're a lot more interesting than measuring a conventional cap because there's not much to measure at all. But a little bit on the basics of uh, what we're trying to measure here. So the, the transpiration cap is like a sponge, okay? So think of soil moisture as water retained in a sponge. The bottom right-hand picture there shows some... Uh, the, in the, the sort of black, um, the black patterned particles, their soil particles. Then between the particles, you have some moisture, which is in blue, and you also have some air voids. Now, the way that water moves through a soil depends on how much water there is. So water loves soil. It likes, it gets very attracted to it, and it, it effectively binds to the surfaces of the soil until there's too much water. And we call that when the channels between those soil particles build up enough, we call that free draining. And that's when water actually drains by gravity down through the soil. But in these transpiration caps, we try to avoid that scenario because we don't want a whole lot of moisture draining all the way through it. So we want to keep the moisture content less than that. So we don't want free draining or the bit that does free drain, we want to catch before it comes all the way through the cap. So very important to understand that really what we're manipulating is soil moisture in the unsaturated zone. Okay, that's what trees typically drink. And we get rain, comes onto the top of the cap and it infiltrates through. If we get lots of rain, it uh, becomes free draining until it gets down and more of that moisture gets absorbed and then we reach a zone which is still unsaturated. And so that holds onto that moisture long enough for the trees to suck it back out. Now, keep in mind, it's not really trees, it's grasses, a lot of grasses. So we're looking at deep rooted grasses. So how does the moisture move around? Well, it really moves around by suction, right? People, a lot of people measure water content, right? So that's how much water's in there. But really, moisture doesn't move around by uh, just how much is in there. It actually moves around via suction or another term for its water potential. So how do we change the water potential? Right? But the less water there is, the more suction there is. And so that water effectively moves towards a lower area of potential. So you see the top little drawing I've got there, it sort of shows what's generating this suction. So leaves of grasses and things create suction. So we've got negative 100 MPA up there. So very high level of suction occurring there at the surface of the leaf. And then as we come further down, we ultimately end up back in the soil and we've got a relatively lower suction, so the plant is able to suck that moisture out of the soil. When it rains into the soil, the suction becomes less and less as it gets more saturated because 
the moisture is not being held to those particles, okay? So what we wanna do is have a bit of a balance. We want the plant sucking enough moisture that there's still a relatively high level of suction in the soil to hold on to that moisture. Otherwise it would all just come whooshing through and out the bottom. What's the risk with these lovely caps? Well, if we don't get our vegetation established, then the water, when it does rain and it reaches that point of those water channels being filled, the water will flow through. And what's the problem of that? Well, when you have lots of leachate, you have lots of disposal costs. And some sites where they haven't got this right, they end up spending a fortune in disposal of leachate. So that's the, the risk. And so that's why you've got to be so careful with establishing your vegetation. So how much can we trust a plant, I suppose, is what it's all about. Well, I think we've lived off plants for many years and we know that they need to be looked after and that's how they grow well. I was listening to Brent, he was saying, you don't want to grow these things, you know, where there's lots of moisture and it's tropical, but got to remember that's also where plants grow well, right? So we have this dilemma with transpiration caps best spot for a transpiration cap if you weren't thinking about the vegetation would be a desert, right? But uh, worst spot for a transpiration cap could also be a desert. Why? Because it's hard to get things established to grow. So you have this sort of dilemma of finding the right balance. And people do modeling on vegetation and that sort of thing, and on the thicknesses of these caps to work out the optimum places to do this and the optimum thickness of the soil cap itself. So there used to be a couple of packages. One was called Vados W, which was an unsaturated flow model, and another one called Soil Cover, which was the original one. What did I want to show you on this? A few interesting things. So there's this concept of effective root depth, okay? What does that mean? It means, well, a plant doesn't suck water from everywhere. It only sucks it from where you've got good established root systems, okay? And it only sucks it from where its suction is sufficient to pull the moisture from the soil. So if you look at this picture on the left, this is just one out of straight off the internet, but it was uh, interesting to note that when you look at the distribution of roots, there's about 70% of the moisture that's coming from really in that top 50% of the root depth. So sometimes people talk about what's the maximum root depth of something, but we've also got to talk about and think about, well, and how much of that moisture is coming across that thickness of soil. So if you plant grass and it grows and it's got, you know, five centimetre depth of um, roots, well, once the water gets past that, it's won the battle of getting to the waste, right? So we have to have a battle to hold on to that. So we want deep rooted grasses that suck a fair amount of water, but are also reasonably easy to maintain. Hope you're following me. On the right hand side here is a sort of schematic of a journey of water through a phyto cap. It's not a phyto cap, the, the picture, it's just any old thing where we're uh, monitoring uh, soil moisture, but the terms are important. So if you have heavy rain, you have surface runoff. And when I say heavy rain, what do I mean? I mean, it's exceeding the capacity for the water to move through the soil. So that's when we get runoff to the side. So Brent talked about needing to have, you know, reasonably steep surfaces to allow some of that runoff to occur. That is important. But runoff only occurs if the intensity is exceeding the capacity for that moisture to move down through your soil profile. So from my experience, a lot of the time, um, moisture does go straight down into these caps, right? Um, you don't always see a lot of surface runoff coming off them. So it is about then making sure you can get it back out, right? So. If you look at those little blue arrows coming down the journey and getting to the to the grassroots, in this particular diagram, it's sort of saying that the top section, we've had enough rain that it's free draining water. And that's why it's got the thing saying gravitational water. Then we hit the zone, which they've called soil water holding capacity. This is that unsaturated zone where the moisture is holding onto the soil 
and it's not all draining out the bottom. That's the zone where the vegetation does its work and it pulls the moisture back out of these caps and uh, we hold onto the moisture rather than having too much deep percolation. Now what's deep percolation? That's water that's got beyond your root zone. So if you don't have a very mature grass, then deep percolation can be pretty shallow and it's still gone past, right? So it's very important to get the vegetation established. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about how we measure those things, because really measuring that movement of water is measuring the performance of the caps. Um, just check the time. I'm gonna skim over a couple of these, just to some schematics, we're a bit short for time. You do need to measure weather, right? You need to know how much rainfall's been coming on. You also want to be able to calculate evapotranspiration. So you need to know things like solar radiation and that sort of thing too. In the soil moisture side of things, we need to measure two things. We need to measure the volumetric water content. Okay, and we measure that as a percentage typically, right? So uh, how much water is in the soil as a percentage of the total volume of soil is what that's about. But we also need to measure the soil water potential. And remember I was talking about, it's this potential and the variance in the potential which drives how water moves around in the soil. So as I said, water doesn't always move down, it moves to that point of highest suction. So we can measure that directly using various sensors that we put in those lysimeters that Brent was mentioning earlier. So what is this talk about lysimeters? So as Brent mentioned, they're a bit like a giant bucket, but what we're trying to do is construct exactly the same sort of cap within that bucket as is across the whole site. It's important to understand that it's not a small exercise, building a lysimeter is a big exercise, right? Um, we then measure the water that comes out the bottom of that, and that's your deep percolation. That's that flux number that the EPA is saying is the critical number, the amount of seepage we're allowed to have, okay? So very important number that comes out the bottom of these. But it's not really that important versus understanding the processes that are working in the cap itself. Because at the end of the day, what are you going to do? Like, you know, you've got too much coming through, but what's causing too much to come through? Is it the fact that the plants aren't performing? And so we need to have sensors to tell us how well our plants are sucking out that moisture. So it's sort of one measure is a compliance measure. The others are telling us what's wrong with our machine, right? Uh, they are constructed in the field and they're big things to build. And I've got a couple of pictures for you. So this is one that we installed recently and thank you for letting us use these photos. Um, so you can see there's a weather station, not a lot of vegetation because this is when it's being built, right? Obviously they're gonna plant a lot of vegetation across this, but a uh, nice weather station here. And then each of these lysimeter groups have a series of soil moisture sensors and uh, suction sensors effectively down profile to measure the variance in soil moisture. Next photo. So just a couple of things that we really do need to measure on these. So we need to have the climate parameters. We're getting that from that weather station. We need to understand the vegetation conditions. And this is a walkover assessment, you know, using a botanist, for example, because uh, you want to get estimates of the plant density, plant growth, and its health. You know, we all know it can be difficult to grow plants. So that's where the effort needs to go, right, to make these work. Uh, we want to measure the water flux as a surface runoff, if we can. Very difficult to do, by the way. Um, we want to measure a water flux, the leakage through the cap. We use a lysimeter to do that. We want to understand the soil moisture variations to understand how well our vegetated layer is performing. Um, and someone needs to keep inspecting the cap to make sure that it's 
not falling apart because of what Brent was saying. The waste that's underneath is consolidating and that's affecting the CAPS uh, structure. I'm going to skip over this one, running out of time. Uh, so to measure the evapotranspiration rates, there's various ways you can do that. Uh, thanks for Gordon for putting a picture of an irrigation <laughs> uh, device in there. But really, it's just to show you what transpiration is and that sort of things. But uh, we use lysimeters. There's a technology called eddy co correlation that can be used. Uh, cost a fortune. It's really got research applications. Or you can use various coefficients to estimate evapotranspiration based on various vegetation types. And that's really like a percentage of your evaporation readings. This just shows you some of the sensors. So this is uh, a sensor that you can derive volumetric moisture content from. The picture on the right shows how they're deployed into a pit that's being constructed in the, the lysimeter to deploy the sensors. This is a suction sensor or tensiometer as they're known. These these are deployed into that same trench that you saw reasonably close to those soil moisture sensors. So in the one area down the profile, you have both moisture content and suction readings. Now, the seepage that comes out the bottom of these um, lysimeters, you'll remember on Brent's picture, we had a, a drainage line coming out. The flows are very small and that's a good thing, right? We, we, we want no flows coming through these things, but typically the, the flows are very small. And so you need a sensitive way of measuring those flows. And that's this picture on the left here has these tipping bucket gate mechanisms. So the water comes out those pipes where you've got those blue arrows there. And as, as those buckets fill up, they tip and that gives you a flow rate. Now remember the, the flow rates, it's not so much needing to know a daily flow rate, right? It's about understanding the flow rate over a much longer period. So often the performance of these caps would be evaluated over how did it perform for the whole year. So these things need to be robust, um, but they do need to be able to handle low flows. From a maintenance perspective, we've been to sites to you know, support these sorts of things. And quite often you'll find these tipping bucket rain gauges have got a, a lot of sediment in them, particularly in the early phase of the monitoring. And that's because you have um, loose materials which come down those drainage lines and end up in those. So it's really important to maintain these, otherwise you can get to the end of your five year trial and not have enough good data to really decide if it's working or not. So that's the end of my presentation. Now we're going to shift to just a little summary of what we've learned. So I think conventional landfill caps contain waste, but not necessarily prevent, what's that say Brent? I can't actually see it on my, uh, I can now not necessarily prevent water infiltration, leading to more leachate formation or the escape of methane. Evapotranspiration caps can contain waste and limit leachate production, but they need care and construction and maintenance if they're going to perform as intended. All right, so over to Q&A. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we had a few good questions that came through the early bird questions. Number one, how do regulators typically respond to alternative cover systems? Are they happy with this? Well, Brent, I think you sort of covered that a bit, but uh, do you want to talk to that a little bit more about where the current status is? I think probably the, the applicants who've tried to sort of get ET covers approved would have more accurate and, and reliable um, advice than myself. But... My understanding is that the regulators uh, still remain to be completely convinced. And that's where the lysimeter data that you've been talking about, that I talked about, um, is so crucial. Um, and 
I think people haven't appreciated that that's um, as important as it really is in the role it plays. Um, there are guidelines, um, and unfortunately, unless you are a member of the Waste Management and Resource Recovery Association, WMRA, um, it's a very expensive exercise to get them, but they, that's where you'll find them. Um, I haven't exactly seen what their the final version is, but those guidelines are accepted by the EPAs across the country. Um, and um, form the basis of uh, how these things are judged. But I think until we start getting more experience with them, and remember that in Australia, for example, the first of these only went in in 2004, and most of the experimental ones have not gone in actually over waste. They have done, you know, most of these um, have been set up in trial cells that haven't been, um, actually capping waste and until that happens and of course you're in a catch-22 there most regulators won't let you take um, an area that's been conventionally covered and cut a hole in it and stick a, a, a fighter cap um, in, in the hole um, that's simply not allowed at the moment um, so there are some issues still I believe they're being addressed um, partly because one of the uh, the, the pressing issues for a lot of municipal associations, councils, etc., is what do you do with dead landfills? Uh, you know, the landfills that were there in the 60s and 70s and have been abandoned, closed off, had football labels put, put over the top, but that's all. Um, and to, to cap them conventionally would be, um, you know, it'd be more than their defence budget to, to actually do that sort of thing. So, ET covers were seen and probably still are as, as a way of dealing with legacy landfills. Um, so, yeah, we, Thanks, we, Brent. We're, we're going to restrict you to shorter answers to get through the quantum that have coming in, but uh, that was good. Yes, no. I would say that uh, on a couple of uh, lysimeter projects on landfills that we're working on, the mechanism that seems to have been adopted is that the auditor will require a a prolonged lysimeter trial, which is built over the waste, right? Um, and providing that all functions well, well, they're happy with that, uh, with the cap. So really it's, I guess the philosophy is, yes, we're okay with you building it, but we're gonna keep an eye on it. If it doesn't, if it doesn't uh, work out in the end, well, that's uh, the problem for the landfill operator. So where you see these lysimeters going in there, the, the regulator has sort of let them at least proceed uh, with the concept. And uh, right now we're reviewing the performance of one of those that's been out there for you know probably seven years now. Um, so next question, are there any specific areas of the regulation of landfills that you think to need to be improved and or removed? <laughs> Uh, I'm not enough, not involved enough to know. I have to admit, it's it's um, you'd need to speak with landfill operators. Um, we I think what I heard from you earlier, Brent, was that you'd like the guidance on the transpiration caps to be a bit more accessible than hidden away in the WMRRs um, side of things. So perhaps there's there's a need for the uh, regulator to adopt it as one of their own controlled docs and have it up on the, on the EPA website, perhaps. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. Absolutely, Richard. Absolutely. Next one's slightly off topic. Sustainable landfills, PFAS soils. Do you have a view of, uh, do they need to be treated any differently? These, these sites with PFAS? Yes, um, they do simply because PFAS is rather different from most um, contaminants in the sense that it's highly water soluble and moves with water so um, but whether or not um, ET caps for example are suitable for capping PFAS repositories um, I simply would not know it would need to be something that was researched and, and backed up by a whole heap of data you know lysimeters etc. So next question, 
uh, is best industry practice with examples for disposing of tailings and waste rock on same landfill. I think it means same as landfill, if any. Um, so certainly what I've seen is um, waste rock dumps, for example, will adopt very similar methodologies as these transpiration caps. And in fact, that's really where they started. Um, so yeah, similar approaches are adopted. Um, that's for sure. Um, do you have anything you wanted to add? To the, the main issue um, with disposing of tailings is that um, you do need to manage the amount of acidity that um, um, gets through and so the amount of percolation. Um, and so operating your ET cover to maximise the, the amount of transpiration and minimise the amount of percolation of acidic um, uh, drainage into it is probably a useful thing as well. I've certainly seen with the construction of caps over, over waste rock dumps and also some tailings is that they try to put in a capillary break, which is a coarse aggregate layer that you then build your soil cover layer on top of. And it's sort of a little bit counterintuitive, but what that does is it stops capillary rise of your sort of particularly saline um, solutions that can be coming out of your tailings from uh, impacting the vegetation you're trying to grow over the top, for example. Yeah. So one thing I've seen. All right, next question. This is also a little bit counterintuitive. Drilling bores into the cap. Do you have a view on uh, uh, have you have you done it? Have you drilled holes into caps? And... No, but um, again, the, the beauty of ET caps is that they tend to be self-healing, um, and you should be able to. It, it's it's perhaps not the drilling of bores that's the problem. It's what happens afterwards. Um, you've got to be able to seal if you're putting, say, a groundwater monitoring uh, or sampling well. Um, through a cap, you've got to be able to seal the outside so that um, uh, whatever you're doing only uh, goes up and down the annual, inside the, the, the tube you put in. Um, so doing that in a conventional cover is always a bit tricky. Um, and doing it in an ET cover, at least the, the cover should conform to the outside of the, uh, the, the ball. Um, so you need to bear that in mind. All right, so they are the early bird questions out of the way. We're about eight minutes over, so we'll keep charging on. We'll, are you okay? Another 10 minutes, Brent? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. All right, we'll charge on into these questions. Matt Taylor, what would you say is the general useful life of a traditional cap before they tend to start failing? Would you expect to get at least a decade or so out of one? I think a decade is at least reasonable, um, but say I've seen a couple now where 15 to 20 years is starting to see quite significant cracking and leaking um, you know, of gas um, from them, which is why we know that, that some landfills keep generating methane for that length of time. Um, so, yeah, I. But also, I am not that familiar with the, um, the current um, industry averages of these sorts of things. So not the right person to talk to, unfortunately. All right, next question. What phyto caps, how, uh, with phyto caps, how deep is the porous soil from surface level to the waste mass? what would the minimum need to be in comparison to conventional final caps? Okay, um, that's relatively um, straightforward and not in the sense that it depends entirely on the seasonal rainfall um, and the porosity and holding capacity of your soil. Um, for example, the Lindhurst phyto cap had um, about a metre and a half of um, capping material, whereas the conventional cover in complete thickness was um, 
only about half a metre. The um, so in a sense, you need to remember that um, fighter caps can actually cost you a bit of airspace. Um, uh, you need to allow for that. But it's 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 not just uh, a uh, particular formula that that uh, says you need this many metres of, of fighter cap cover. You need to do the calculations of just how much water you're going to have to deal with, and that affects the thickness, of course. So I might just add to that. So that was um, earlier I was talking about the modeling that can be done. So there are models you use to do simulations. Um, so there was one called Vados W, which you put in like a daily rainfall data set for a particular region and um, do your simulation and it, it calculates your sort of evapotranspiration rates and that sort of thing. And you keep increasing the thickness of your soil until you are uh, modeling and, and achieving your desired um, seepage rate at the bottom of it. So um, typically to get the, the thickness right, you need to do some modeling. Okay, next question from Gillian Marchant. Could ET be added to existing clay capping to have trees and shrubs naturally self, or do you get trees and shrubs naturally self-seeding which had to be removed as directed by EPA, fear of damaging clay caps? I think this is all about how do you control the vegetation and what's the matter? Yeah, the, um, uh, the, the answer there is two parts. One is that the reason the EPA um, want you to keep trees and shrubs, etc., off conventional landfills is exactly right, that, that they will breach the clay cover and damage it. And there's another question um, further down, um, what happens when trees die, fall over, all that sort of stuff. Um, this um, on a conventional cover is bad news. If you, um, and there would be no reason why you can't add um, a, an ET cover on top of a conventional clay cover, provided you make sure there is that capillary break and that um, there is enough height of the, um, the ET cap to allow your plants to grow without uh, breaching the, the underlying clay. Um, but I'm sure that's entirely doable. Um, with the issue of what happens when the trees die, um, in a conventional cap, that causes breaks, cracks, that sort of stuff. But in an ET cap, the very nature of the medium normally means that it simply sort of collapses around the, uh, the dead uh, roots, etc., and doesn't cause a problem. Next question, so I think it's an important one, is um, can we please provide that reference? So it is the WMRR reference, isn't it? That, yes, um, yeah. I'd have to look it up. I don't have it on, on hand, but I can send it around um, or send it to you to send it around. It's not actually that easy to find. Uh, no. <laughs> it's looking pretty hard for that at, at the Sorry. moment. Right. So um, let's let's come back to Dinesh on that one. Um, Dana Windle, issues with deep-rooted plants if they die, fall over, and potential to expose waste. Assume design needs to look at the rooting depth. We sort of answered that one before. Certainly, if a big tree falls over, it does compromise the, the cap. There's no doubt about that. It would also be fair to say that if you've started an ET cap and you wind up with big trees on it, by the time they get to dying and falling over, um, possibly because they've entered the waste and have been, you know, uh, hit something toxic. Um, it might be argued that the waste underneath is fairly stable um, and this is less of a problem. And, and I get back to the fact that um, ET covers are certainly much more self-healing than conventional covers. Um, you do have to allow the appropriate depth and some of the work that was done in the early ACAP program um, did show that you, tried not to get really deep rooting plants in your cover. Um, and that if you had the, the right mix of plants, um, 
it actually reduced the uh, opportunities for some of the more deep rooting species to establish themselves as droppings. Okay, so next question, what's the pros and cons of using a drain gauge as opposed to a pan lysimeter? Mm. <laughs> okay. uh, That's yours, I think, Richard. Yeah, I think so. So a uh, the pan lysimeter, I'm assuming you're, you're estimating evapotranspiration from your evaporation pan data and applying a coefficient to it. So one's assumed based on crop coefficients, if I've got this right, where as the other one is a true direct measurement of the performance of what's been built. So the in the end, the regulator pushes towards these lysimeter structures um, and literally draining out the bottom of them because it's simulating exactly what's been put in place, including the vegetation. Where you're using things like coefficients, and apologies if I've misunderstood your question, um, they're, they're based on a certain maturity of that vegetation in itself, right, for achieving that evapotranspiration. So that they are an approximation. So that's the downside. Um, next question, why are these not recommended to be used for fresh waste young fill areas? I suspect that it mainly, um, if you like, regulatory inertia um, and that we haven't enough examples of where this has been adopted. Um, but remember also that um, most landfill operations, the, the, the waste, the, the cell is open for some considerable length of time, um, a year or two, uh, possibly longer, depending on the size of the cell and how much waste is being deposited each day. Um, and the, the caps are really not put in place until the the whole cell is, is completely filled. So uh, it's, it's not quite as simple as it looks in terms of saying, yeah, look, if you've got a fresh um, landfill, put a photo cover on it. Um, the question of whether you can do, in a sense, a, sem a temporary photo cover is, is interesting because, for example, one of the things that the ACAP program actually showed is that the grass cover on a conventional cap actually transpires away a lot of the water. That's quite an important phenomenon. And therefore, rather than seed the, the, the temporary areas of your new landfill with just grass, um, perhaps we could look at other species of plants that have higher um, transpiration potential and look better um, and that sort of thing to, to make these things work but uh, I'm probably not the right person to answer that completely. I think you did a pretty good job. Okay, so uh, next question from Aidan Hall. Um, it probably depends a lot on landfill contents, but what are the considerations around the time it takes for landfill cells to subside and the vegetation types used in a transpiration cap? Could a landfill cell subside after trees, larger vegetation are established? And what effects would this have on the vegetation effectiveness of the cap? Okay, I believe the beauty of the phyto cap system, the ET caps, is that as that waste um, collapses, um, the cap keeps up with it. And you, you want the, the, because the cap doesn't depend too much on the geometry of, you know, how each of the plants are related to each other physically in space. Um, it would self-heal and adapt very, uh, very effectively um, and, and probably become more effective with age. The main difficulty may be that if the, um, the cap essentially becomes a dish, and uh, you know the, the the runoff tends to pool in the middle. Then you may have a problem. Um, so, because most of them depend on the fact that the runoff runs away from the cap, 
um, rather than in the middle. That may be the only difficulty that you have in this circumstance. But you can repair that by simply adding more growing material until it has the right profile. All right. Well, I think we've got time. Well, we haven't got time, but we'll make time for the last five questions, but no more. Um, so Dinesh is trying to stitch you up with a reference that says uh, <laughs> that recommends phytocapping being the best option for legacy landfills. I think the word best there might be a bit loaded. So um, I think what we might do, Dinesh, is we'll add a few recommended references to the slides that we're putting up onto uh, our website and um, we'll include the links to that other guidance document as well on that so you've got those readily available and Dinesh the um, um, I guess the other answer is um, there may not be regulatory guidance but there's almost certainly likely to be economic guidance that says you've got this legacy landfill and you want me to spend five million dollars to put a cap on it um, you know that, that sort of decision is um, we are reaching a point where we can quite clearly show that there are cost, considerable cost benefits in using ET caps. Okay, so Hamish McKenzie, famous name in landfills. Mackenzie, is there any potential for utilising wasted construction materials, e.g. crushed bricks and glass in the evapotranspiration cap soil medium? Um, limited. Uh, and it depends very much on the state in which that material is placed. We, for example, in the ACAP program, tried using crushed um, waste construction materials, brick, concrete, etc., uh, as the drainage layer, and it was much too irregular and with lots of sharp corners, etc., to be useful, say, in a lysimeter um, cause problems. You could possibly dilute your growing medium but at the, with this, this material, but there are two considerations you must bear in mind. One is that you've got to have plants grow. You've got to, it has to be something plants can grow in um, and grow well, and it has to look good. So you don't want your final cover to have all sorts of bits and pieces um, sticking out of it, um, as would probably inevitably happen if you use this in the, the final cover. Remember that aesthetics is a criterion that various people look for in the performance of the, of the cap. Next question from a world famous horticulturalist and my brother, Alex Campbell. <laughs> Any work being done on vegetation selection and soil microflora slash fungal associations and the effectiveness on methane control? Good question. Alex, the, the short answer to that is not enough. Um, I do believe that there were um, possibly two PhD students in the ACAP program um, who, whose work started well after I left, um, who looked into these sorts of things, but the ongoing um, sort of microflora um, work and indeed the methane control aspects, I think, are ripe for further research. Next question, anonymous attendee. Any use of shallow dishes in sandy soils to retard infiltration and hold water for plant establishment? I'm not quite sure what this question means. I think what it's inferring is if you have heavy, if you have a site with sandy soil and you get heavy rainfall and get some infiltration into it, is it would it be beneficial to have some kind of, um, you know, dishes layered through it to trap that uh, infiltrating water that would then be as the soil dried out redispersed back into the soil for plant growth okay so, um probably yes but uh you'd have to say that it would take some careful design and a you know a full-blown research lysimeter type system 
to demonstrate whether that could work. Um, but I agree that something that slows down, and it may not be dishes, it could be, remember you, you construct the, the um, fighter cap um, in layers, inevitably, you, you, you know, you can't just sort of chuck a metre and a half of stuff in uh, a cap all at once, it's all laid down in layers. It, it would be possible that you could um, set layers di uh, of different permeability um, into these covers, but it would have to be checked and, and shown to work in a, a trial system. One way to achieve a similar thing to that is, is through that sort of capillary break mechanism I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier. Yep. So if you have a layer which has got very wide soil pores and then you put finer grain material above it, you can wet up that soil that sits above it more than you normally would be able to before it starts to drain through. That's, um, simply because there's a much lower suction in the capillary layer. Remember I mentioned about suction and that water moves from areas of high suction uh, from low to high. So that's one way to achieve that. Last question. Now Dinesh has exceeded his two question uh, quota. <laughs> But, uh, what is the downside of sealing cap cracks with compost as opposed to bentonite? Okay, um, I assume you're talking about conventional you know, covers with cracks in them, because generally speaking, if a, an ET cover is constructed properly, it keeps conforming so it doesn't crack. Um, and that's one of the whole reasons that they're, that they're chosen. But if you're trying to repair cracks in a conventional cover, um, repairing them with compost may work, um, provided you've got sort of plants growing in the material, etc. But you can't um, in any way guarantee that. And trying to repair them with with um, bentonite, um, yes, you'll repair the crack, but the forces that um, cause the cracking in the first place will apply next door. Um, and so it's a uh, hiding to nowhere. It's, uh, I believe, uh, repairing conventional cover cracks with bentonite um, or any other clay material, that sort of stuff, is really a hiding to nowhere um, because it'll just keep happening. Um, it, it may help reduce the amount of fugitive emissions, etc., but it won't solve the problem. And it may actually be that the longer term solution is actually to apply an ET cover on top, as one of our other um, attendees suggested. All right, Brent. Well, that has brought us to a close. Thank you very much for presenting and thank you very much for so many people uh, attending and asking all those great questions. Really appreciate that. So great to see you again, Brent. And Thanks for sharing your knowledge today. Thanks, Richard. Thanks for the opportunity and uh, good luck with all of this. Thanks, Thanks. mate. See you. Bye.